Good morning, afternoon, good evening from wherever you're, you're signing in from. Uh, I'm taking the place of chair today uh, as P Chloe and Paul are on a plane to Copenhagen. Uh, my name is Rajin Nagaka. I'm a first year PhD student studying uh, eco games and collaborative behaviours. And I'm also part of the Manchester Game Centre, um, which is, you know, this is where this talk is occurring. Virtually, I suppose. Um, the Manchester Game Centre is an interdisciplinary research group of academics and postgrad students at base of the Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, looking at games at play. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary um, centre, including people from the departments of English, sociology, computing, mathematics, philosophy, uh, School of Digital Arts, uh, architecture, and the writing school. So we really seek to promote work, uh, work in game studies at local, national and international levels, um, working across other institutions uh, and partners in the game industry. <clears throat> so today we have two speakers, uh, Rob Gallagher, who is a lecturer in film and media at the Manchester Metropolitan University. His research explores conceptions of subjectivity, selfhood and belonging in digital culture with a particular focus on video games. He has published in journals such as Games and Culture, Convergence and Game Studies, and written for the New Inquiry, New Inquiry uh, Guardian and Architecture Review, and the author of Video Games, Identity and Digital Subjectivity, published by Root Ledge in 2017. Um, take it away, Rob. It's all yours. Thanks, Reggie. So I will um, get some slides up for my talk, if I may. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a uh, game called uh, Oikospiel. Um, don't know whether people will have played it. i um, interested to hear your input if you have, because I'm grappling with making sense of it, um, as this, this paper will show. Um, but my paper is called Asset Flipping While the World Burns, uh, Oikospiel and the Aesthetics of Salvage. Um, and for those who haven't played it, uh, Oikospiel is a uh, game by David Kanaga, and uh, it's essentially a patchwork of prefabricated 3D models. Um, it uses these models to trace connections between the labour politics of the games industry, the vicissitudes of copyright law, um, and the intensifying climate crisis. Um, and as players, we're invited to understand the exploitation of workers, the hoarding of intellectual property and the depletion of natural resources as different facets of the same fundamental problem, the problem of capitalism. Um, and against uh, these forms of enclosure, exploitation and extraction, Oikospiel proposes an aesthetics of salvage, um, or this at least is the term, um, here are some screenshots of the game that I probably should have shown you, you can um, maybe see here that there are some 3D models of uh, copyrighted characters like Nintendo's Diddy Kong and uh, Disney's Pluto. Um, but yeah, salvage is one of the key words for this project. And it's one that um, Kanaga and his uh, collaborator, Liz Ryerson, use um, in a video that they created for the Indiecade Festival uh, a couple of years before Oikospiel's release in 2015. Um, the video is called Neolib Ear Zero. It's on archive.org if you want to watch it. Um, and in it, they use this chorus of synthetic voices to deliver a kind of uh, manifesto. Um, among the things these voices tell us are that we must acknowledge the pile of waste we have created as a culture, and that we must focus particularly, they say, on the most disposable pieces of our ephemera. We have to do so not with an eye to rebranding or selective reselling, but in a spirit of salvage, taking what is stagnant, awkward or upsetting and finding in it an opportunity to do something new. Um, and Oikospiel essentially puts these precepts into practice. Um, it's a work of digital bricolage, a concept that Stefan's work I found very useful in, in thinking through. So I'm excited to hear um, his presentation today. Um, and it's constructed out of a vast library of secondhand models and assets, some bought from asset stores and libraries, um, others poached from canonical games like Mario 64 or The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Um, of course, the use of pre-created assets in and of itself is hardly unusual. Um, today, many games are constructed wholly or in part out of ready-made assets. Um, 
as Brendan Keogh and Benjamin Nicol observe, um, this increasingly widespread practice has occasioned something of a backlash among certain gamers. Um, for these players, so-called asset flips, games that use store-bought assets instead of investing the time and resources and labor to produce bespoke ones, um, are seen as a symptom of incompetency, laziness, and greed. Um, and it is fair to say, I think, that uh, the rise of asset stores in combination of that with uh, that of digital storefronts like Steam has facilitated its fair share of cash grabs. Um, but I also think that trying to insist on a hard and fast distinction between asset flips and real games quite quickly um, gets you into trouble. Um, not least because uh, commercial developers have always reused assets. The uh, Morrigan sprite that Capcom used for um, 10 or so games in the 90s is notorious among fans of uh, that company, for example. Um, and commercial developers, including Capcom, have also gotten into legal trouble for scanning or tracing or otherwise borrowing um, images, assets, resources that uh, maybe not are strictly legally theirs. Um, in recent years, of course, we've also seen games like Mario Maker that have found success by uh, delegating the work of assembling libraries of assets to players. That is the game in this case. Um, such games build on a long history of uh, mods and uh, fan games um, that are created out of bits of um, familiar commercial titles, uh, a lineage that runs from early Doom mods to things like Gary's Mods, a phenomenally successful physics sandbox um, that has long served as a platform for anarchic, ludic mashups. Um, there are also a lot of avant-garde and experimental games that use this same approach as Oikospiel, um, using assets and models and sprites from familiar games to uh, subversive or political ends. Um, so what distinguishes Oikospiel in short is not Kanaga's methods or materials. Um, rather, it's the way um, he uses these to raise questions of environmental stewardship and of resource management. Um, and as its name hints, Oikospiel was deeply preoccupied with the relationship between economics and ecology, terms that have a common origin in the Greek word oikos, meaning hearth or household. Um, so in using other people's assets to explore this relationship and to think about these themes, um, Kanaga picks up on something that the designer and critic Stephen Murphy, um, who makes games as the Catamites, has also observed. Um, and that is that the discourse around asset flips um, often bears traces of some of the deeper cultural anxieties that are maybe beginning to come to the fore in the age of the Anthropocene. Um, so Murphy, in a uh, Tumblr post from five years ago now, um, notes that attacks on asset flips are quote unquote often weirdly racialized. Um, he notes that tirades about services like Steam being flooded uh, with games like these uh, smack of the automatic bad faith extended to the global south, the fear of nameless hordes overrunning our valuable exclusive institutions. Um, he also suggests that in the figure of the asset flipper with 100 interchangeable games, we can recognize a near relative of folk devils like the welfare queen or the bogus asylum seeker, these racially coded stereotypes who are presented as the undeserving beneficiaries of systems that they notionally threaten. Such stereotypes, of course, obfuscate a less palatable truth that far from being threatened by greedy outsiders, um, such systems are in fact uh, dependent on the exploitation of what are often precaritized, racialized labor forces drawn from the regions that are most vulnerable to the ecological impacts of capitalism in general and uh, digital capitalism perhaps in particular. This at least is certainly true of the games industry, uh, whether we think of Foxconn workers who are underpaid to assemble games consoles um, or of the many studios in the global south who are subcontracted and often uncredited by uh, AAA studios producing 3D assets for them. So I think um, one of the things Oikospiel is about is these circumstances. Um, but it kind of addresses this situation in a way that's often quite oblique uh, and definitely very eccentric. Um, 
And it also suggests that while it's important to attend to these kinds of material conditions, um, it's also important to think about the kinds of story worlds that contemporary media companies construct uh, and through then the kinds of spatio-temporal imaginaries that those companies promote. Um, only then, when we're thinking about the material conditions, but also about um, the imagination and these products, um, can we really understand gaming's role in larger architectures of exploitation and ecological degradation? Um, which brings us to Oiko Spiel's own story worlds. Uh, the game's plot is very unwieldy and very involved, uh, and I'm not sure I fully understand it myself, to be entirely frank. Um, so I will avoid it. I'll, I won't try and give a full synopsis, but I'll give uh, maybe a bit of its flavour, um, the, the kind of uh, premise. Uh, and I'll then go on to introduce one character in particular who I'll use to talk a bit about the game's uh, themes and the way it explores them. Um, so the basic premise of Oikospiel is that in the year 1999, the Oikospiel and Opera Company hires the video game publisher Koch Games to adapt Thomas Stern's 1789 novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman. Um, they're supposed to turn it into a computer eco-opera for a fee of infinity. Um, Koch Games subcontracts a team of cybernetically uh, in augmented dogs to complete this adaptation. Um, and gives them a deadline of the year 2090. This is the date within Oiko Spiel's story world that has been set for the Geo Spiel Jubilee, a magnificent future event which will pay reparations for all of the species extinctions over the last and next 100 years in the form of a grand opera of debt forgiveness. Um, so as I said, it's, it's quite a weird plot. Um, and uh, while we're told to look forward to this uh, moment of reckoning, uh, when there'll be reparations made for the damage that has been done to the planet and the creatures on it. Um, as every reader of Tristram Shandy knows, um, such projects don't always run to schedule. Um, that novel, indeed, the, the kind of central gag at its heart, um, is that the narrator's attempts to uh, tell us the story of his own life become so mired in backstory and so trammeled in digressions and so behind schedule um, that he has to abandon all hope of catching up to the present in the end. Um, so the ins and outs of that plot aren't necessarily going to be hugely important to what I'm arguing today, but that is uh, Oiko Spiel's scenario. Uh, more important today maybe is to acknowledge that where Stern in Tristram Shandy um, stitches together passages from other authors and musicians, uh, uh, from other authors in Stern's case, from Burton, from Rabelais, from Bacon. Um, Oiko Spiel alludes to um, and in fact incorporates works by a variety of authors and musicians as well as video game designers. Uh, so at one point you can uh, read the entirety of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein within the game if you so wish to. Uh, it incorporates bits of Monteverdi's opera Orfeo, uh, Virginia Woolf's Flush, uh, and Celine Dion's uh, immortal torch song, My Heart Will Go On. Um, the result is a game, or as Kaniger has described it, a shaggy dog opera um, that's extremely dense, extremely hard to follow, kind of bursting at the seams with all of these heterogeneous materials. Um, so as I said, the way into it that I want to give us today is to talk about one particular character. Um, this character who uh, goes by the name of Donkey Cock and is uh, the billionaire head of Cock Games, the video game publisher at the heart of this plot. This name obviously has some more profane connotations that I imagine will be apparent to everyone. Um, but it also condenses a number of other allusions and references that I think helped to bring Oiko Spiel's message into focus. Uh, to gamers, it will probably evoke Donkey Kong, the uh, 1981 arcade game that gave uh, Nintendo an early hit and uh, the designer Shigeru Miyamoto, who would go on to make Mario Brothers uh, a sort of first taste of success. Um, this game also earned Nintendo a copyright lawsuit from Universal Studios, who were less than amused by this homage to King Kong. Today, of course, Nintendo are themselves notorious for issuing cease and desist letters to um, fans who are trying to uh, make new projects based on their properties and characters. 
Um, at the same time, the company has proven very much willing to work with uh, select corporate partners, including Universal Studios, who are currently creating a Donkey Kong Country ride for their Universal Studios Japan uh, Nintendo World theme park. So um, this, is a, this is a key theme in the game. Um, and uh, Kanaga himself has said that Oikos Bill's unauthorized use of 3D models from games like Donkey Kong 64 or Wind Waker um, is supposed to be a way of fighting back against copyright law, um, which he says argues, um, which he argues uh, favors big players like Nintendo. Um, so that's one reference at work here to uh, people who might be more au fait with US politics than video games. Uh, Donkey Kong's name might evoke. Uh, David Koch, the late libertarian billionaire who you can um, see here. Like his brother Charles, David Koch was a renowned patron of the arts and sciences. He was also a major funder of right-wing causes and uh, as one might expect of the heir to a vast petrochemical fortune, um, was a particularly a passionate advocate of climate change denial, um, funding a lot of organizations and think tanks uh, devoted to that cause. Um, Oiko Spiel's world, which is littered with uh, oil derricks and shipping containers, private jets and shrinking ice caps, um, shows how figures like the Cokes have uh, reshaped the world to suit themselves. Also um, noteworthy is the way that Donkey Kong's signature within Oiko Spiel is rendered in the famous Disney fonts, a typeface modeled on Walt Disney's handwriting. Um, where the Koch's wealth came from exploiting natural resources, um, we could see Disney's as coming, at least in part, from his canny privatization of cultural resources, cultural resources that were once held in common. Um, as the Walt Disney Company transitioned from shorts to feature films, Disney hit upon a strategy of taking public domain folk tales and turning them into lucrative intellectual properties that the company continues to exploit decades after his death. Um, in 1955, meanwhile, with the launch of Disneyland, uh, the company built on the template set by earlier World's Fairs and Pleasure Gardens to sculpt a um, immersive, seductive, branded space, one that has, of course, exercised uh, quite a profound influence on video game designers. Disney today has become the mega conglomerate of the transmedia era. From Star Wars to Marvel to the Muppets, they've amassed a huge treasure trove of intellectual properties that they're committed to extending and exploiting across sequels, spin-offs, reboots, remediations, and crossovers ad infinitum, seemingly. Um, so Donkey Kong is kind of a, a proxy for some of these figures, um, but also for Kanaga himself, you can see on the end there. Um, this is the DK who is ultimately in control of Oiko Spiel's story world. Uh, and where Donkey Kong in the game's plot conscripts a team of canine cyborgs to construct his game, um, Kanaga constructed Oiko Spiel out of these 3D models that he borrowed and bought. Uh, and he also used uh, bespoke scripting tools created for him by his uh, collaborator, Fernando Romalo. Kanaga has said that these resources essentially enabled him to employ a virtual AAA labor force very quickly. Um, so it's um, it's much like being the head of a, a major commercial publisher. Um, he said that while creating the game, he found himself assuming the role of a kind of no borders and cap or narco capitalist Coke brother with an insatiable appetite for cheap labor assets and gleefully generating so much CPU heat that his computer became a kind of microcosm of the earth in the age of global heating. So Donkey Kong is both the arch villain of this game um, and a kind of author surrogate within it. And as such, this character reflects some of the ambivalence at the heart of Oiko Spiel. Um, Kanaga has said that he initially wanted to create a game that resonated with my values, that was propagandistic, pro-worker, pro-earth, etc. Um, but Oiko Spiel eventually developed into something a lot less didactic. Um, the game charts the story of uh, Cox's conflict with Eurydice Wolf, a labor organizer who inspires his uh, subcontractors to strike, but who's ultimately betrayed by scabs and turncoats. Um, and through this narrative, it's obviously able to mount a critique of neoliberal capitalism, uh, but also to dramatize Kanaga's own complicity with this regime and his dependency on tools and resources that it's made available to creators. Um, 
And here it's probably um, important to acknowledge that there's not necessarily anything inherently creative uh, or progressive, subversive or redemptive um, about this kind of digital bricolage that Oikospiel is an example of. Um, repurposing an existing 3D asset is not like reusing a shopping bag or recycling a newspaper. Um, true, you might be saving on the time and energy needed to create new assets, uh, but in a way by um, poaching and redeploying these models, uh, Kanaga's only really deepening their carbon footprint and extending their proliferation, we could say. Um, and I think here, uh, Peter Nelson's work, he's, he's written a lot about uh, Valve source engine and the forms of kind of modding and reappropriation um, that it's been used to affect from Gary's mods to things like Counter-Strike. Um, I think uh, Peter's work is, is very useful. Uh, he's argued that Gary's mod may be the ultimate climate change game, uh, not because it represents global heating, but because as a platform for endlessly recombining scraps of pop cultural detritus into new configurations, it kind of embodies this drive to um, keep making things, to keep CPUs running, uh, to keep... Um, that keep us all online playing, producing heat, using energy. Um, so I think, again, there's an ambivalence there in Waco Spiel's use of similar aesthetics, this kind of asset flip look. Um, so I've not finished quite yet, but I have nearly finished. Um, so if, if we can say that this recycling isn't in itself inherently green, I guess there's this question of uh, where um, Oikospiel's uh, green credentials or its pretensions to being a green game or an eco game come from. Um, by way of uh, answering that question and bringing this paper to a close, I wanted to turn to a comment by Alan Bergman, the president of Walt Disney Studios. Um, and it's a comment that is cited by the critical theorist Esther Leslie um, in her work on uh, animation and its uh, quote unquote, a historical relation to our world. So in a 2011 press release, which was announcing Disney's decision to reissue a range of its classic films in 3D, Bergman stated that great stories and great characters are timeless. And at Disney, we're fortunate to have a treasure trove of both. Um, as this comment hints, Disney remains committed to amassing a growing horde of stories and characters um, that it believes it can use to lure consumers into the kinds of immersive, cosily self-contained enclosures that the company specializes in constructing. Mm. And I would say that their streaming platform, their uh, theme parks, uh, and their fictional story worlds all kind of fit under that umbrella. Um, these enclosures are constructed so that those inside can ideally no longer see beyond the, uh, the ramparts of the corporate walled garden. They're also rhythmically organized in ways that dissuade consumers from looking too far into the future. Um, so Disney's armies of subcontracted creatives are tasked with gradually elaborating and extending the corporation's uh, familiar stable of uh, story worlds. By filling in gaps in these worlds, fictional timelines and their fictional topographies, they're also filling out Disney's release schedule. Uh, they're ensuring, for example, the steady drip feed of movies and TV shows that keeps people paying their Disney Plus subscriptions. So when someone like Bergman representing Disney speaks of timelessness, um, I think we should recognize that what such companies are selling is a promise of plenitude and continuity, a promise that things can and will go on more or less as they have been going on forever. Uh, a promise that's very seductive, but also increasingly disingenuous in the context of the climate crisis. Um, I think it's against that kind of model that Oikospiel is uh, levying this aesthetics of salvage. Um, it's got this very dense, teasingly elliptical plot. Um, it's got this world that, as you can maybe see from these stills, uh, barely hangs together, full of things of sort of clashing looks and textures and sizes and scales. Uh, full of seams and half digested gobbits of other texts. Um, and I think um, that is, among other things, a strategy for um, asking players to kind of look beyond the world at hand, to notice how kind of uh, flimsy it is, and to acknowledge the histories and the material conditions that have brought us to where we are. Um, so I'll maybe uh, leave it there for the minute. Um, and thanks for listening.
to what it's probably apparent is very much a work in progress, thinking about this game and its relation to some of those issues. Oh, excellent. Thank you. That was, um, that was, that was fascinating. Hmm. Um, so if we, we're going to save all our questions for the end and then kind of approach them with both speakers. Um, so you can put them in the chat if you don't want to um, read them out yourself. <clears throat> So our next speaker is uh, Stefan Verning, uh, who is an Associate Professor for New Media and Game Studies at Utrecht's University, uh, where he founded the Utrecht Game Lab and organises the annual Eco Games Summer School, which I can personally recommend. It's, it's a very good week. Um, he, personally, he previously worked as an Assistant Professor at the Universities of Beirut and Bonn, and as a Research Assistant at the Fraunhofer uh, Institute of Media Communications in St. Augustine. While completing his PhD dissertation, Stefan has worked in the digital games industry, most notably at Nintendo of Europe and Codemasters. Uh, Stefan has been a visiting scholar and fellow at the Center for Comparative Media Studies at MIT, and his latest book, Making Games, um, published in 21, uh, was also published in the Playful Thinking series at the MIT Press. Take it away. All right, thanks, Reiki. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and sh sh uh, share my screen. One second. I need to go into full screen mode. Let me see. All right. Does it look correct on your end? Yeah, 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 all good. Yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> That's good to know. Well then, uh, yeah, thanks to Eiji for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me in this format. Um, I think uh, after having uh, heard Rob speak, uh, there are quite a few uh, overlaps, I would say, between our topics, even though I'm going to uh, focus less on one specific example and more really on game modding itself as critical discursive practice, as the title shows. You will also see that there are a couple of uh, differences after Rob's very polished presentation. Mine will be a lot more improvisational, I think, also because the topic I will be talking about is a bit more work in progress at, at this point. Uh, but uh, yeah, I should be able to formulate a coherent argument about this, and I'm happy to take questions afterwards. So let's jump right in, I would say. Um, uh, I will start by uh, just outlining a bit the premises of this talk. Uh, then I will focus on a couple of examples, things that I've been working on with students as part of the summer school that Reiji mentioned, but also in other courses we are teaching uh, about using digital game modding as a means of fostering critical climate communication. And uh, then I will shift the focus towards modding analog games, which is where we normally don't use the term modding, but like Chloe Buckley and Paul Wake, for example, use terms like hacking, maybe board games. Uh, so I will move over to that and at the end talk a little bit about um, the kind of institutional um, conditions, I would say, that need to be met to allow for modding to become really a form of discursive practice that um, can be transformational on a societal level that has an impact on the industry, but maybe also an impact on how we perceive um, the topic that these mods are about. Um, so I will start more broadly, with, uh, so I will focus on eco-modding indeed, but uh, I'll start by just talking a little bit about my take on modding itself. So modding games as a form of collective simulation and discourse. There are a couple of practice-based game research methodologies out there. Stefan Gualini, for example, he talks about making games as a playable, as an executable thought experiment. Uh, so he puts them in the philosophical tradition of um, yeah, imagining certain scenarios to explore concepts. Greg Loring Albright has talked about critical modifications. So he's made a new version of Settlers of Catan, where he imagines the role of what he calls the First Nations of Catan, like the inhabitants of that island. Elizabeth Laponce has been working with indigenous communities, um, not so much using game modding, but um, collaboratively creating a game to translate their cultural experience and histories and knowledges into a game. But most of these methodologies usually uh, culminate in one finished example. So one 
complete game, if you will. And what I'm more interested in, and that's why I gravitate towards modding, is really keeping um, this unfinishedness, uh, keeping the process open, if you will. And that's why also um, with my background, I come from literary studies originally. That's why I'm looking towards uh, literary scholarship and people like uh, Wolfgang Iser, for example, or Winfried Fluck, who talk about literature as a kind of collective simulation game, as a laboratory of possible societal futures. And they also talk about how the recycling of literary motifs affords this kind of critical societal discourse. So literature provides us with character archetypes, with uh, ways how specific types of stories uh, begin, uh, unfold, and end, for example. And uh, so they not only provide these finished novels, but they also provide raw material for repurposing and remixing. And uh, this is the kind of perspective, uh, literature as symbolic action, that I want to translate to games as well, and looking at uh, how certain games at the moment are already being used to explore um, eco-critical themes, like, for example, sustainable uh, living. Uh, I think is already a step in that direction. So um, The Sims is one of the games that I've been looking at, the Civilization game series as well. If you look, for example, at how Sims modders envision a sustainable home, there's quite a little bit of this kind of societal discourse happening. Different questions being raised. Does a sustainable home also need to be affordable? Uh, what kind of ideal typical family should a sustainable home accommodate, etc.? So by making these mods, people uh, create room for these kind of conversations, not just about how a sustainable home looks like, but also how it's intertwined with other kind of society pertinent questions. All right, that was a lot about my first slide. Let's. Uh, pick up the pace. Just two premises why I think eco-modding, uh, like modding for ecological awareness is really useful. One is indeed what's called the, new for, the need for new eco-narratives. Corinne Donnelly has been writing this uh, very interesting article where she talks about the fact that we need new stories to tell about um, well, man-made climate change and also possible solutions to the climate crisis. So she talks about how uh, all the stories that we have at the moment are usually predicated around on uh, conflict, on making progress, on developing tools, technologies that we need to combat climate change. So that kind of uh, rhetoric, martial rhetoric already points you a bit in the direction that she is critiquing. And also this idea of direct intervention, that there's something that we can uh, directly do to mitigate the implications of climate change. And we see lots of examples. I put two examples here on the left, the giant wall of watery doom uh, that we see in um, a couple of films, which are usually also subsumed subsumed under the label uh, eco-cinema because they talk about the implications of climate catastrophes. So Donnelly is saying we need new narratives. We need circular narratives that don't really lead to an endpoint, but that remain open, that embrace circularity. We need narratives of degrowth and rebalancing where maybe also it's not just about more, 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 but also about something just remaining as it is over time, which are stories that seem quite unfamiliar to us. And uh, that's why I think where mods come in and uh, commercial games might be hard pressed to come up with these kind of stories. And if they did, they might uh, find it difficult to find an audience for these stories because this is a gradual process and we're uh, quite accustomed to these stories, Donnelly critiques, of course. And so it takes time to, uh, to adapt. The same thing applies not only to stories, but also the characters that act out these stories. So eco-personas. Um, there's quite a bit of research on the limited inventory of eco heroes and eco villains that feature in the kind of stories that we encounter. Uh, so either you have like almost, uh, well, comically stereotypical characters like Lisa Simpson or villains like Poison Ivy, for example, that bring in other complications as well. But the fact of the matter is that most of these personas are not really uh, offering identification options for most people. Uh, and the, also the things that they do don't resonate with things that we could adapt or uh, apply to our everyday life. So, well, just a different version, I, I think, of the argument that uh, Donnelly is making. And eco-games, um, 
might be a way of uh, addressing these issues, but uh, there's also be some um, more reservation about what role they can actually play. Uh, so Rob already talked about uh, the ambivalence of games as a means of weighing in on eco-critical discussions, so on the other, especially digital games, but also in the board game space, there are increasing discussions, of course, about sustainable production, about all the little plastic tokens and miniatures that people love to sell on Kickstarter, of course. So in both cases, games can be an important tool to raise awareness or maybe also to foster dialogue, but they are also a part of the problem in a sense. That's why Benjamin Abram in his book from last year, Digital Games After Climate Change, he uh, calls for an interaction model of climate communication with games. So interaction model means not just playing games, but uh, thinking through games, working with games uh, to um, um, to find new ways of talking about sustainable futures and also working towards them in a way. And I think modding can be seen as part of a broader spectrum of alternative consumption practices. I think Oikospiel, the Oikospiel example for me also might be a way of really enacting alternative production practices. Maybe what you said about this aesthetics of uh, salvage, uh, but there are also other uh, forms of alternative consumption practices like um, Rainforest Scully Blaker, for example, he's working on slow gaming, on deliberately uh, playing uh, through your backlog, on trying to resist the cult of the new. Nicole Lammerich has been working on um, sustainability concerns in game fandom, like making cosplay from renewable materials, etc. So, and I would say recycling games for eco-critical uh, messages might be part of that spectrum. There's a little bit of work on this already. Uh, I think Kyle Boniki with his 2017 article started this discussion where he discusses a couple of ecological mods of um, Skyrim. And uh, in this account, uh, eco-modding appears more as a form of textual extension. So you're identifying gaps in the original game as a model, and you're filling these gaps and thereby also engaging in um, agenda setting, drawing attention to certain aspects, for example, the birds and flocks mods, which uh, adds more complex bird behavior, and thereby at the same time also draws attention to the fact that the existing, um, well, um, behavior of animals in the game is often far from realistic, also interactions between different animal species. So by filling in these gaps, uh, you can at the same time also critique uh, the original game as a model. Same thing about weather mods, for example, that add more complex weather states, or that also intensify the effect of weather on the player, that heavy rain might actually be a real burden, not just an inconvenience, something that doesn't look nice on screen, but something that actually uh, might prompt players to reconsider their playing style. Then you also have these more fun, quirky uh, mods like the trash cans of Skyrim, where which puts up these barrels where you can drop the stuff that a lot of players would normally just drop anywhere they are in the environment. Uh, so there are a couple of interesting examples, and it also shows uh, how different people emphasize different aspects of the game in their eco-critical modifications. But in most cases, it's really about making extending Skyrim itself. So um, I would like to take this a step further and think about indeed modding or eco-modding in particular as a form of critical discourse. So there is this kind of shift from reading games to writing games has of course a quite a long history. For me, um, this um, originally, I think it was a Wired Magazine article, but I think it's now on Slate, uh, the article by Clive Thompson on video games as a form of social comment was quite eye-opening in that regard. So I put a screenshot here on the left, which also has the link to the article where he talks about how people made flash games as a response to the impending uh, uh, invasion of Iraq in 2002, the attack on the World Trade Center and how people negotiated these complex feelings they had and uh, vented frustration and engaged in societal debate by making games really. And I think this is really um, the kind of utopian idea of where this might lead to, similar to how other forms of cultural production, like for example, creating PowerPoints or visual communication have become democratized over time. I think modding is just one still tentative step towards writing or speaking games in a sense. And it's playful in and of itself. Uh, Bolo and Lemieux, they talk about 
modding as a form of meta game, making a game out of a game. So uh, repurposing uh, elements of a game as instruments, equipments, equipment, tools, toys uh, for various purposes. So they acknowledge by with the meta game concept uh, that modding in itself, people set their own goals, people uh, have uh, maybe refined their mental model of what they want to achieve and how they're going to achieve it. So there is a, a very tangible playful quality to it as well. I think I should maybe pick up the pace a little bit. So yeah, uh, elaborating on this idea, what I'm currently really interested in is uh, the rhetoric of eco-mods, thinking of eco -mod, not of the individual eco-mod or mod, but as uh, on the process of making and remaking these mods as a form of ongoing conversation. So for that, I think what's needed is what in an earlier uh, book chapter I called the diachronic procedural perspective. So where normally uh, procedural rhetoric refers to uh, meaning that's built into uh, a rule system of a game at any given point in time. What I think is interesting with modding is that these rhetorical implications come from changes over time rather than any individual contingent state. If you take a game like Civilization, for example, Civilization exists in many versions, depending on the official expansions that you have, on the in unofficial mods that you might have installed that can also stack and give you a very different tailored uh, gameplay experience. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think what's interesting is to look at um, uh, these patterns of change. And for that uh, chapter, my focus was on the implementation of religion in uh, civilization, which started in, around civilization four. And the model of religion in the game has been continuously refined because at the beginning it was quite cynical actually. Religion at the beginning in civilization was almost like a, an information, like a spy network. So you could send missionaries into other countries to find out things without needing to declare war, for example. And then uh, what's interesting about this is not just this one snapshot, but really uh, what changed and uh, what kind of rhetorical implications do these changes have? And of course, on the one hand, uh, Firaxis itself uh, expanded the game, but also people have been creating quite a few uh, religion mods in civilization, adding different religions, tweaking the way certain units work, etc. So there are quite a few um, uh, rhetorical implications of making uh, these uh, modifications. I think for the interest of time, I'm not going to elaborate on these right now, but we can come back to this uh, later, I guess. What would be more interesting than at least is to look at a couple of examples of rhetorical operations through mods, right? If you think about the things that we do with verbal rhetoric, for example, we can affirm a certain statement, uh, we can try to delegitimize it, we can try to formulate an alternative version or reframe an argument. And all these things could also apply to mods, right? If I want to, uh, if I make a mod, let's say about um, the religion system and civilization, I could pick out a certain rule and try to incorporate that procedure more deeply into other systems as a way of saying, yes, this is how it should work. We need more of this basically. So a way of procedurally affirming this uh, procedural argument. Um, it could also delegitimize a claim, for example, by ed exaggerating um, its parameters by trying to show that this rule, if you just uh, take it a little further, uh, produces extreme and uh, ridiculous results, possibly. Just like verbally, I would try to take somebody else's argument and tweak and radicalize it a little to show maybe its uh, flaws. And same thing about formulating alternative, I could maybe add a different way of achieving a certain result, let's say in civilization. These are a couple of um, ecological mods in civilization that tackle, for example, things like flooding or um, the implications of climate change in the game that were added with the uh, 2020, I believe, Gathering Storm expansion. Um, so there were a couple of people who changed really the rules of uh, climate balancing in that game, trying to make these effects a bit more delayed, but at the same time, more impactful. So it would be even more difficult, like in real life, one could argue, uh, to grapple with these effects, because once you notice them, it's maybe almost too late. 
Um, so just a couple of examples of uh, what I've been trying to do with this. Obviously, modding a game can be quite uh, daunting, depending on the type of game that you choose. The students I work with usually have non-technical backgrounds, so I need to find ways uh, to uh, not have to focus too much on technicalities. And map modding in civilization is a great way to start, of course. So you could just take a specific uh, map and um, rework it also in a way, an executable thought experiments. There are a couple of ways to do this uh, strategically. So one would be to complicate uh, what I call the Iceless and Arctica trope. So going back to my earlier slides, this is one recurring theme in um, uh, civilization mods. So apparently Al Gore talked about this idea that at some point Antarctica might be iceless and might become a territory that will be hotly contested by various global powers uh, because uh, it might be a very important um, yeah, territory at some point and habitable, et cetera. Uh, so uh, that would be one way to do it, right? Like just take Antarctica as some people have been doing. Um, and uh, create a map that shows uh, how how it would look like uh, with the ice caps uh, receding, like where could people settle? What kind of resources would they find in these places? And what kind of power struggles could emerge from this uh, situation? A second example would be, um, for example, using a resource placement, but uh, um, using real world data uh, to inform these decisions, like aridity projections, which areas or flooding. I mean, uh, I'm in the Netherlands at the moment, so there are quite a few worrying projections about how by 2050, uh, maybe the city of Utrecht, where I'm in at the moment, might be coastal city. So uh, taking these current projections and trying to build maps uh, that transcode these um, a numerical data into a specific world map and then have people play on that map to see, yeah, what would that feel like? What would, uh, what, um, would people and would civilizations need to uh, keep in mind to be able uh, to live and thrive in such an environment? So yeah, this, uh, I think it's useful to think of this as a form of collaborative environmental storytelling. You're not just creating that map, but you would also have to think about what would players do on this map, really, right? So um, uh, Markus Schulfke talks about video games making players participants in flawed worlds and thereby uh, giving them a, a chance to think about the um, origins of these flaws and ways to address them. Uh, created. So in that sense, I think making these kinds of mods would be uh, akin to um, this kind of collective simulation that I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, and the game that I'm working with the most at the moment is Fortnite, which is specifically interesting because Fortnite is, I assume, about to release its um, eagerly anticipated creative 2.0 uh, update in April, I believe, uh, which uh, will vastly increase the modability of the game, also being able to um, um, to include um, custom assets, etc. And yeah, I mean, Fortnite has been used already uh, to uh, create uh, societally relevant arguments. Uh, so uh, the World Wildlife Fund in France, for example, had an advertising campaign in collaboration with Fortnite, I think three years ago now, where they uh, hosted a tournament and asked people not to use resources, not to build, not to, and maybe you, if you played Fortnite, you know that at least at that point in the game, people would just hack away at anything and everything in the game to create resources to be able to build defensive structures. So um, the no build challenge was one way to draw attention uh, to uh, yeah the finite resources that we have to contend with in real life. Then there was the very controversial March Through Time campaign in uh, 2021 uh, in collaboration with Time magazine, which uh, was supposed to celebrate uh, the work and life of Martin Luther King, uh, but was quite controversial in its own right for reasons I cannot really talk about at length now. But uh, yeah, all of these are really more top-down uh, initiatives, whereas what I'm more interested in is uh, reusing, repurposing uh, the kinds of devices, gameplay mechanisms that Fortnite offers, which already have some connection to uh, possible uh, sustainability themes, right? So you have things like campfires, you have uh, fireflies that can burn down um, 
uh, woods, you have fishing zones, you have flooding devices that can gradually or like immediately flood a map. You have physics-based tree devices, which in the game are used as traps. So if I chop down a tree, I can make it fall on my opponent and cause damage maybe. But all of these could also be subverted in a way to um, draw attention to uh, important real world uh, issues. Uh, so the idea here would be in my mind more defamiliarization rather than making a nuanced procedural argument like you could maybe in a game like Civilization. It's really more about just using these devices in different ways, maybe making a flooded city map, for example, that is not really a playground, but that demonstrates uh, uh, the dangers and the difficulties of um, yeah, having to uh, live in this environment or even escaping such an environment. So I remember chapter two, season three of Fortnite was called Splashdown, I think two years ago now, maybe somebody, some uh, one remembers, which was this kind of water world scenario and which, which really had this uh, flooding theme, like everything was flooded and it's a big uh, playful environment that everybody can have fun in. But just trying to tweak these kind of, um, uh, motifs uh, that uh, Fortnite has at the moment could have a massive impact given the huge player base of the game, of course. Um, it would just have to come in a more uh, grassroots manner than this kind of top-down approaches like the March Through Time event was, for example. Yeah, and that brings me to um, the second much smaller part of my talk, which is shifting the focus a little bit from modding digital games to analog games, where usually the term modding is not really used, uh, but uh, can also be quite productive. So we had a project recently um, with a couple of uh, stakeholders in the Netherlands uh, that was about uh, Dutch drug policies, like about the uh, dilemmas created by Dutch drug policies, collaboration between different societal institutions, healthcare, uh, law enforcement policy makers trying to come up with ways to mitigate uh, drug abuse related uh, uh, societal uh, threats. And uh, what we tried to do was take a game that the CIA made a while ago, which is Collection Deck, and just including two cards from this game up here. So it's a game that the CIA uses to train its recruits. And instead of making a new game about this, we tried to take this game, which is about quite a similar issue about um, uh, policy dilemmas, and try to mod this game to try to get people to bring their own uh, perspective into the game, to design new cards, to translate uh, their own lived experience into the language imposed by the game's rules, by the game's card layouts, etc. So that's uh, kind of an extension of the same idea of game modding as a form of critical discourse, just not in digital games, but in analog games. And there are quite a few digital tools that can actually augment this process that we've been exploring. So you see here on the bottom screenshot, this is Tabletop Simulator, a tool that I use quite extensively. They used to be very uh, helpful, especially during the uh, tailor teaching, the COVID pandemic, but also still is quite useful uh, to because you can collaboratively play board games, but even more so, you can collaboratively mod and hack board games in um, tabletop simulator. And it allows for a couple of things that physical board uh, hacking, physical modding just doesn't afford. So you have a library of thousands of games as assets. Uh, so that might be a nice link to Eukerspiel and this idea of asset flipping. So in Tabletop Simulator, you can download thousands of games, many of them actually legitimate versions. And you can just take things from them. If you see a miniature you like, you can take it, put it in your own game. If you see a nice board or a set of cards, just take it and uh, change things. You have online play. Uh, and what we've been experimenting, not me personally, but people in Utrecht is using machine learning to create a generalized board game AI that would allow you to uh, make these kind of modifications uh, and allow play test them against an artificial um, intelligence uh, opponent. And that might actually be uh, a lot more useful than just like a technical gimmick because it would actually uh, emphasize um, the um, importance of balancing these kind of modifications and hacks. Because that's something we noticed over lots of different experiences of working with digital or analog mods. It's 
quite easy to take something apart. It's much harder to put it together in a new way that still works, that it, it need not be perfectly balanced. Maybe keeping it unbalanced might be part of what you want to try to achieve of your procedural rhetorical argument you're trying to make. But still being able to think about uh, what you're making as something that still works as a procedural argument is quite difficult with and could be really um, uh, helped uh, with uh, these uh, tools. Maybe to wrap up, uh, so uh, one thing um, I'm currently doing at this point is really to identify board games that might be suitable as platforms uh, to incorporate and discuss uh, uh, the multitude of uh, sustainable innovations, but also climate threats that are being discussed on blogs, YouTube videos, all kinds of media at the uh, moment, right? So just two examples that I've come across recently, aquaponic farming, the idea that you grow your own vegetables on your balcony, maybe with an aquaponic farm or agroforestry, these kind of new or sometimes rediscovered uh, techniques um, would be really interesting to incorporate into a game like, for example, the Stardew Valley board game or the Pursuit of Happiness board game, which is like a more recent version of the game of life in a way where you uh, have a character that uh, you play their life. Uh, so, um, yeah, modding these games might be a way to discuss the potential implications of these new innovations in ways that really afford that kind of interaction model that um, Benjamin Abrams was asking for uh, beyond just watching a YouTube video about uh, these things, which is also can be quite insightful, maybe even transformative if you decide to pick this up for yourself. Uh, but yeah, modding board games might be a way to continue these conversations um, in a creative way. Uh, these are tools that we are using. So on the right, you see Tabletop Simulator. Uh, on the left, another tool that we use quite a bit, which is called Nandec, which is uh, a tool, a free tool that you can use to generate playing cards from spreadsheets. So, uh, and the cards you make in this tool, uh, you can directly import in Tabletop Simulator. So practically speaking, this has been a very productive way of making new things uh, to extend and mod uh, board games. These are just a couple of uh, things we think about at the moment from a methodological perspective. Autoethnography is quite important, right? Observing ourselves, our own design process, which ideas as a group individually uh, do we emphasize? Which ideas do we discard and why? Uh, also, in many cases, we notice that modding board games, for example, can give people a sense of empowerment because you're moving beyond this idea of the game as a mere product, in a sense, like really performatively moving beyond it. Also, tool criticism, on the one hand, being critical of the modding tools we use, of the limitations of, let's say, the civilization uh, world uh, maker, but at the same time, also rethinking the game itself as a tool as a tool that might in itself have a persuasive message, but as a tool that we can also uh, tweak further to maybe um, extend or modify that message uh, over time. And a final thing that is going to be quite important is documenting design cha uh, changes across mods. So we use a simple notation system like this, but there's not really any consensus on how do you easily uh, make visible uh, changes between different modifications, for example. And if you think of these games as an, of modding as an ongoing conversation, it would of course be important to be able to understand what kind of changes are being made and to quickly be able to see that. And that's my very last slide, I promise. So what would be needed? I think what's most important really uh, for this idea to take hold is a platform to retrace and preserve these kind of what I would call mob-based conversations really. And this is maybe a useful example here on the left. Some of you might have seen this. I think it uh, emerged in around 2018, uh, a mod for civilization uh, that uh, sim, uh, simulated uh, the FIFA as a civilization in the game. It was very critical of FIFA. So this is the migrant worker unit uh, that they put in the mod. 
Uh, so it, way before the 2022 uh, World Cup discussion, it already uh, was very critical of the politics of FIFA, uh, of the relationship between FIFA management and the countries hosting their events, etc. And uh, so a very important mod was picked up by the gaming press quite a bit at the time, but it's not available anymore. I tried to find it again on the Steam Workshop and it's not there anymore. The only uh, like uh, traces of uh, this mod now um, are um, these blog articles that we have. And it's also not really possible to respond to this mod anymore by maybe tweaking it again, by making certain uh, changes. Uh, so I think that would be really important uh, to move beyond these individual mods as alternative texts and really shift the focus towards the process of modding in and of itself. And yeah, that's all for now. Thanks a lot. And I'm looking forward to uh, questions and comments. And I'll stop sharing right now. <clears throat> oh, excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have about 20 minutes for um, questions. I think you're all able to uh, unmute yourselves now. Um, so feel free, I'll put them in the chat um, and I'll read them out for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, Juniper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yep. Still muted. Oh, right. Uh, you should be able to. There we go. Okay, I've got them. Oh. There we go. I've got permission now. Um, so I, I suppose I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of, uh, of an artist and, and researcher. Um, and I suppose as, as somebody who works, uh, creatively quite a lot, I suppose my, my big kind of question, um, is, uh, why, why modding specifically as a method for engagement? You know, what is it about the act of, uh, recreation and, reuse that makes uh, this kind of practice distinct from say uh, making games about climate change from scratch or for you know in, in, in Rob's case making games about salvage and um, uncovering uh, stories from scratch where where is kind of the the unique um, potential of this kind of bricolage and this kind of um, collaged uh, process. What, what, what is it about that that makes this special in regard to say just going out and making the thing yourself from scratch? Should I start maybe just to, yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. So from my perspective, I think uh, Rob already talked a bit about the importance of course of making new games like uh, costing a lot of resources, the development itself. If we look at eco games, also serious games, even those commissioned by large institutions, by the United Nations, for example, it has a disaster mitigation game. When you look at the numbers of who plays these games, and sometimes they're poorly maintained uh, because the code base is not really maintained. Sometimes they're not, they don't work properly anymore on uh, more recent computers. Uh, so for me, it was more a practical argument to start with it, to recycle these games. On the one hand, to make an argument, of course, maybe it also re it's related to salvaging, but also very practically speaking, uh, using games that people already play by the millions and trying to insert these kinds of messages in a way that uh, encourages responses again. I think that for me is the most important things. Uh, like, I don't know how people in Fortnite would, uh, for example, uh, react uh, to making these kind of mods. I mean, you would have to share them through the official marketplaces, of course, through the Fortnite uh, system for disseminating these kind of custom islands. But uh, yeah, I think there's definitely a practical argument to be made that these games, they're going to be kept relevant. They're life service games or they're long running franchises. Uh, so um, they're doing some of the important work, I think, uh, for us in trying to use these games to get the message out. So for me, yeah, these practical concerns were at least um, the starting point, I think. And I, I think, yeah, I, I would agree in, in terms of how you're going to um, 
potentially intervene in prevailing imaginaries and actually reach people releasing a formidably sort of obtuse dense art game on itch um is, is not maybe the best way to do it but but i think oikos bill it is itself a testament to that power of mods to kind of speak back to the the dominant culture um and that that very tension that you you are allowed and encouraged to but only on certain terms um and it is in some ways a sort of bizarro world version of Fortnite that's supposed to be all encompassing and to be a place where all of these intellectual properties mesh neatly um and i think there is a power in disrupting that it was very striking steph and the examples of skyrim where mm -hmm. some of the mods that are uh, in some ways representing or facing up to climate change also feel like they slip quite neatly into a certain rhetoric of modding as supplementing the game as making it richer and more realistic um whereas others i thought the the trash can feels like a, a beautifully disruptive gesture adding something but reorienting you towards particular mechanics in there um which yeah i, I was not aware of that but but very interesting yeah I think what's interesting also about these mods is indeed, I mean, that was my entry point into this whole phenomenon. I would probably not even have noticed all these dispar disparate mods if Kyle uh, wouldn't have had that brought them together to make his point about. So there is not really, um, I would say for many players of Skyrim, not really an acute awareness that these mods exist, that they might be a specific genre of uh, co-creative content or so that one could actually look out for maybe while uh, like trying to, uh, yeah, try something new in Skyrim, for example. So that's, I think, an important downside that these mods still have, that they don't really have a platform. I mean, if you go to, um, let's say, the Steam Workshop page for Civilization, you can type in eco or climate, and you would get like a small selection of games that are mods that might have the kind of themes you're looking for. Uh, but they are still quite all these little islands rather than one coherent discourse of sorts. So I think that's still one big uh, issue, like more an organizational issue than a conceptual issue. Yeah. I think, um... It's interesting the mods it kind of um sits at that intersection of making eco game or seeing eco games as kind of thematic theory of narrative right where you have like a climate change narrative and you make people aware of that through play um and then what abraham talks about in his book is the kind of materiality of it and it's an eco game one that's produced in a zero carbon supply chain and mods kind of taps into both of those simultaneously um which is, it's quite interesting mm. but then you know as, as you're talking about slow gaming as well you know, is there a record of how long that uh, the modifications extend the life cycle of a game? I know for Skyrim personally, I was bored of the, the base game quite, you know, after a couple of playthroughs, but 10, what is it, 12 years? Like, yeah, 12 years later, I still find an excuse to play it through, you know, different mods. Um, even though is, they keep releasing it on different platforms every year, but, you know, that's beside the point. Which is, I think, why... Um... Yeah, in some ways, the recycling of assets, recycling's green, but it, it's, um, yeah, there is that question of to what extent are you kind of extending the lifespan of these media that people might engage with for more hundreds of hours um, versus being thrifty or, um, yeah, so I've, I've, and I, I don't know in terms of uh, what, how you'd quantify that or what the, uh, what the questions are. I, I don't know whether old games consoles are more are less sort of carbon hungry than newer ones and whether that's an argument for retro gaming or not but um i think um ben abraham's work is, is great in actually setting out to answer some of those questions as well and uh, making making those discussions less abstract um i if i could ask stefan a question i i was i really liked this idea of modding as a kind of conversation and of these different rhetorical moves that were possible and particularly how it it may be enabled people to occupy a different register to some kind of climate discourse that can be quite pious or quite scaremongering but were you also aiming to capture conversation among players in terms of comments or as they're playing a board game if, if these are if these are supposed to be sort of interventions that inspire people to discuss things or to rethink them have, have you kind of looked at that aspect of it what people are actually saying and typing mm -hmm. 
Uh, a little bit, yes. So I mean, I've written an uh, an article, I think, two years ago now about eco modding, where I also looked a bit at the discussions that were taking place in the comment section. Absolutely, and there's some interesting stuff in there. Something I only noted fairly recently when we did this in class was, uh, and I found that quite uh, surprising actually, because I never really thought about this, is that by now you also seem to find more reactionary responses, both in the mods themselves and in the comments. So there was this one mod that was really interesting. It was reduced climate uh, impact or so uh, by this guy who said, I'm so fed up the game as a model. I mean, it just uh, uh, tries to thwart all my strategies. Climate change is far too, um, uh, too influential in gathering storm. We need to tone it down a little bit to make it more realistic. And then, um, so you also see that, but I think that's, uh, I mean, it's maybe not a yeah, a very, uh, it wasn't a well substantiated argument, uh, but it's kind of, uh, I would say, uh, I mean, it's probably to be expected that also these kind of voices will eventually find their way into the modding sphere. So yeah, I mean, I, I looked a little bit at these comments as well. What I would still hope for, this is maybe a bit like an utopian view on this idea, is that at some point there might be uh, people who start modding the mods, right? So respond to a mod in a sense. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, that's something that at the moment there is little incentive to do, I would say. Most people who make mods, they make their own stuff. But uh, that might be really interesting. And that's something I've been trying a little bit to incorporate in classes to take somebody else's mod and then uh, position yourself towards it by tweaking a couple of rules uh, in a way that you think, uh, yeah, makes a different point. In a sense. Um, and were they catching those critiques in terms of ludic balance or all oh, these woke developers visiting their <laughs> ideology on us or, or both because I, I guess some reactionary mods or a lot of reactionary mods have responded to um attempts to make games more demographically representative but they've, they've often stayed at the level of character models um i'm thinking of lots of awful uh, skyrim mods that will make uh, <laughs> the armor of female characters more revealing or clean up their faces um and this feels like it's a, a systemic and ludic level and it's it's a balance issue for the game rather than just something cosmetic so are both of those yeah. at work uh from the little i've seen yes uh but i've only had really just anecdotal evidence at this point i must say so i can't really i mean it's still a small space Anyway, from what I could find, I think there are maybe a couple dozen mods uh, for civilization that I've looked at yet. Uh, for The Sims, it's a bit more, but many of them are also variations on a theme, if you will, like different versions of an eco-friendly home, for example, which is interesting, of course, because there you do get very different variations. So people express different concerns. Um, uh, or different things that they need to see in a sustainable home in their version of this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you would find um, uh, these forms of reactionary discourse as well. In some cases, people also seem to be open uh, to uh, discussing this. So there was one more uh, question about this Iceland and Arctica where they were saying, well, this map is not very balanced. All the good resources are at the center. So it's really, uh, if you wanted to uh, play this map, it's really the gameplay is really too streamlined. There's only one viable solution, but well, and apparently the resource placement was based on some kind of data uh, 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 data set or so. So, I mean, that would be one example where, let's say, your gameplay experience crashes, uh, clashes uh, with, uh, yeah, what this mod actually tries to simulate. And that's also where I think, like, just playing that mod by itself might not be enough, really, right? If you just play this for yourself and maybe you, you take away some things uh, it might have an impact, but the impact would be far greater if it if you would have a, a platform where you could actually discuss these kind of things more actively, right? Maybe maybe in a classroom setting to begin with, but also maybe other types of conversations. At the moment, it's still quite isolated. All these um, mods that really uh, garner attention. I would say. Yeah. What I found interesting, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe that question from the chat, I don't want to really hog the conversation here, but I would also have a question. Um, Juniper, did you have a follow-up question, you said? Hmm? Me? Huh? 
There we go. Yes, sorry. It seems that you've got you've got to manually unmute people. It seems it's, it's strange. Um, I suppose just um, looping around to kind of um, talk about the follow up, especially in it, it was mentioned earlier while answering my original question. A slight tangent, and also about the um, particular the FIFA game in re relation to civilization. Uh, I'm interested as to sort of what your thoughts are about the idea of like the the precarity of these modifications, you know, like when they exist, oftentimes they use these legal gray areas and sort of um, also, again, like, you know, to to loop, to loop in both this idea of like, you know, copyright in these kind of collaged experiences, what what it's like kind of, what, what, what are your thoughts on working in an environment where you are kind of at risk of going, you know, one day Sid Meier and his company somewhere can go, you know what, I hate the Steam Workshop, they keep ruining Antarctica. And just you know, pull the plug. What's it? What's it like working in that context? And what are your sort of thoughts on how to, you know, ironically, how to make it more, a more sustainable practice when you're when you're kind of relying on these uh, this this pre existing infrastructure? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a very fair point. Absolutely. So, and the politics of these modding tools are indeed something that I think uh, is still not really addressed enough. Because at first it looks, of course, nice. You have the Steam Workshop, you have the possibility to put your work in front of, uh, let's say, uh, at least a potential audience of thousands of players. So that sounds like, and they host it for you for free. So that sounds like a great deal. <laughs> but uh, again, I mean, like you, you said, I mean, obviously you're also playing by their rules in this case. I'm not really sure. I, what I haven't done is really interviews with people, for example, who do this kind of thing. I mean, I've been reading in detail uh, the descriptions, the comment sections. So modders often respond also directly to uh, critical questions in the comment section. So you have a bit of, uh, let's say, uh, an idea of why they're making these mods and what their concerns were. So I can't really say like if they experience this as a precarious situation. I think. It's similar to, I guess, people who make fan games, as Rob was already mentioning, like if you make a Nintendo fan game, you can basically bet on it being uh, receiving a cease and desist letter at some point, I guess. So yeah, with FIFA, I wonder what the reason might have been for uh, them to take it down if, it, if FIFA maybe uh, got wind of it and actually asked for the mod to be taken down. Maybe they took it down for some other, so I have no context really for this, but I think it's important to be aware indeed of that kind of precarity. So um, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of unavoidable, I guess, if you want to use these games as platforms, you have to play by their rules to a certain degree, um, but it would maybe be important to uh, think about uh, at least some ways of preserving these kind of mod-based discussions in a way that can exist beyond these platforms. Even if Steam Workshop disappears tomorrow, uh, that we still know what people, uh, yeah, what kind of content people created and uh, what they are, in, uh, what uh, what changes uh, to the game they pr um, uh, proposed. I think. And I, I think um, this is, well, for one thing, obviously, it's got to be one of the most cited papers in uh, game studies, right? The Kuk click on precarious playbook back in 2005. I, I think it's still a remarkably um, astute account of what remains the case. But um, Oikospiel, I, I can't uh, play it on the laptop I'm on because uh, Apple have uh, dropped compatibility with 32-bit apps. And in, in some ways, it's ever been thus. But the, those issues that it's talking about, about these kind of uh, corporate walled gardens and the uh, issues of kind of compatibility and how we're all kind of uh, contingent on the, the whims of platform holders and sort of ever more so, um, it's it's what the game's about, but also it, it's become a sort of a, a case study in it. Um, and yeah, I think linking that, that there's this very kind of... Um, extractive attitude to the the kind of labor and creativity of of fans and players but also this um this sense of like we we get to write the rules and say what's allowed and what's not um it it kind of remains the the logic of the the games industry 
you know, if David Kanaga, if he actually was contacted by Disney or some company about uh, his use of these assets. I mean, I, I thought, I mean, it, especially the untextured goofy model or what, what that, whatever mm. that was in one of your screenshots. I mean, it looked a bit like, uh, yeah, uncanny in a sense, because you recognize it, but not really so. But uh, did any company actually uh, uh, try to... Uh, to act against that i'm i'm not aware of it having I, th I think it must have flown under the radar um i can't remember how in the start of the game it kind of credits it actually tells you who produced all of the models that were legitimately bought and whether they're from sketchfab or this asset store that and then it has um several characters as sort of unauthorized players who can't be remunerated because they're under contract to someone else or something like that. but it, it appears to have flown under the radar remarkably but nevertheless to have been killed off um at least for mac users by just uh, the whims of apple um and it's on itch which i guess was at the center of um epic and apple's talk about um what uh apps would be on an iphone and um how they would kind of uh gatekeep that so um yeah, I I think it, it does seem like there are still these spaces where um, things can fly under the radar, at least for some time. But it, these this software always does all feel inherently ephemeral and, and precarious. The FIFA one, I would love to know if there's a story behind uh, behind that or uh, whether it's yeah, a result of policy or not. Yeah, we found any article about this. It just unceremoniously vanished at some point. So, but there is lots of um, there are lots of articles about what it was like, like what kind of design choices they made. Also, this idea of uh, like uh, putting uh, FIFA uh, or representing FIFA as a civilization, not really as let's say a company as part of a bigger civilization, but a civilization in and of itself. I think that's also kind of a neat uh, like bricolage technique, like using the kind of structures, the units of meaning that the game provides. Um, like cities, civilizations, units, et cetera, and trying to map that onto the real world situation. So I think that made a pretty fair point, but it must have also been really laborious to make. It was a pretty extensive mod, much more than let's say one of my students could have done for a paper or something like this. So it's quite, uh, yeah, quite labor intensive for sure. I think we're probably coming to the the end of our allotted time, aren't we? Should, yeah, should I? Um, I I did want to um give a little plug for some of the upcoming events that we have. If I um jump back on and um share my screen again, because uh, there's a few things coming up. Some of them online and some in person that people might be interested in. Um, so hopefully people can see these now. Um, so we have a a play test next week of a relationship storytelling RPG, um, a, an online talk in late February about uh, history games and deep time. Um, and uh, Reggie, I believe you'll be presenting some of your research uh, next month, which I think is on some similar themes to some of what we've been talking about today, right? It will. You'll be blessed once again with my dulcet tones. So, yes. Um, <laughs> I'll be. And, uh, I put the chat on the air. Uh, put a link uh, to the Manchester Game Centre in the chat as well, uh, to the website. Fantastic. And I'm um, into late March. We have a, a playthrough of a romance game book about horse riding. I believe a choose your own adventure book, so, uh, which is alas in person only. But um, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, really great to talk to you, Steph, about about your work. Really, really fascinating stuff. Thanks. Um, the playtest event is that online or is that only uh, on it's, location? It's face to face, unfortunately, oh. um, in the salutation, okay. yeah. which more than one to come to. Just uh... might be difficult then. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I'll be a bit far. <laughs> sounds awesome. Mm. Also, like remaking uh, an actual uh, well card game. I didn't know the mind was by Wolfgang Warsch, but mm. like just using that as material, that would have been really interesting. Mm. Mm. Hmm. excellent well uh, thank you to you both for speaking and thank you for um attending today uh, that's everything i wish you well